plan. Now, what I'd like to do tonight is, by the grace of God, I would like to help us see what it means to truly decrease that he will increase. Because if we don't understand that concept, we truly will never have victory over sin, ever. And what the devil's trying to do is he's trying to get us just caught up long enough to where we don't understand victory over sin so that we miss out on heaven. Now, you've heard Moses say it over and over that the Lord is trying to make up a team. And he's trying to put a team on the field that can receive the latter rain and give the loud cry. Amen? Have you heard him say that? Now, what I want each one of us to do today, because we really need to search our hearts. We really need to search our hearts. What I want each one of us to do is be honest with ourselves when I ask you this question. Based on your prayer life, based on your study life, based on your relationship with Christ, would you be a good choice to put on a field? See, now, how many, how many people in here have played sports? Football, basketball, something. Now, when you were, when you were practicing for your sport, When you were practicing out on the field for your sport, you were not the only person that was going to fit your position. There was somebody that you, or, or maybe more than one, maybe more than two, maybe th three or four, that were biding for the position that you were biding for. Amen? And what you had to do is you had to practice harder. You had to be more devoted in order to win that position. Now, what Christ is looking for is someone that's devoted so that he can put them in that position. God's willing to use anyone. We have, open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul gives us an example here of how man strives to, in, to earn an earthly crown. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 24 says, Know ye not, are we all there? Know ye not that they which run in a race run all? But one receiveth the prize, so run, that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is what? Is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we a what? Incorruptible. I therefore so run not as uncertainty, so fight I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body under my body, and bring it into subjection, least that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself be a castaway. Paul is describing two different sporting events in these games. Running and boxing. And he's saying that those that are striving to be the runner... Those that are striving to be the boxer are temperate in all things. Now listen to what the prophet says. She says, if heathen men, 4, 4 T, page 34, if, if heathen men who were not controlled by enlightened conscience, who had not the fear of God before them, would submit to deprivation and the discipline of tra training, denying themselves of every weakening influence, merely for a wreath of perishable substance and the applause of the multitude, 
how much more should they who run the Christian race in hope of immortality and the approval of heaven? Based on our study habits, our prayer life, would God put us on the field? See, when you travel around the world, you see that there's people in other countries that have nothing that are more serious about the gospel. They're not caught up in all the the cares of this life that we have in this country. They're serious about the gospel. See, there's a concept going around the Adventist church. Now, you know what? I want to take a second so that you understand when I say Adventist church. Go with me to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. See, brothers and sisters, we want to be Seventh-day Adventists, amen? Matthew chapter 25, and let's look at the difference. Matthew chapter 25, beginning with verse 1, are we there? Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom, and five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, and while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet them. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Now let me ask you a question. Were five merely looking for the advent of Christ? Huh? Huh? But wait a second, let me, let me ask you a question. Five were wise, five were foolish, and she says that, that they, none of them were hypocrites, amen? But did we have five that didn't see the need of the character development? Didn't see the need of the seal of God? Where do we find the seal? Where do we find the seal of Seventh-day Adventists? In the Sabbath, brothers and sisters? Why would the devil want to separate the name Seventh-day Adventists? Would he like to get us focused on only an Advent without desiring the seal? Come on, brothers and sisters, think about it. You have five Adventists in this story, and you have five Seventh-day Adventists. You have five that desire the seal of God and are willing to surrender self to receive the character of Christ. But only five other ones are simply satisfied, simply satisfied in their own righteousness to sit and wait for the advent. So brothers and sisters, when you hear me refer to Adventists versus Seventh-day Adventists, I want to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. Multitudes in this world are witnessing the game of life, the Christian warfare, the monarch of the universe, and myriads of heavenly angels are watching with intense interest the, interest the efforts of those who engage to run the Christian life. The reward given to every man, brothers and sisters, catch this. The reward given to every man will be in accordance with the persevering energy and faithful earnestness with which he has performed his part. In the great contest. Based on your effort in prayer. Based on your effort in study. Would you obtain the prize? Let's be honest with ourselves, brother and sister. I tell you what, when Moses and I were driving down here this morning. I told Moses, I said, man. The message that God, I thought, laid on my heart. And last night when we left here. I said, Moses, God said I couldn't preach that message. What he said for me to preach was about me. He said, share with the people your study life, your prayer life, and let them see if they're in the same condition, having the same trouble you are. How many times will we be sitting in church or sitting in our study, waiting to study, 
We've prayed for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit starts to come in to feed us what we need for that day, and all of a sudden our cell phone will ring. And we'll get up out of church, we'll stop our worship time in the morning, and we'll answer a cell phone to talk to some earthly person and put heaven on hold. Come on, brothers and sisters. I guarantee you, we're struggling. How often do we not get up in a consistent time? But one day it's this time, the next day it's this time, the next day it's this time. And we frustrate angels because they don't know how to work for us. Frustrate angels. All heaven is working for our salvation. We'll put them on hold. We'll say, wait, I'm sleeping this morning. Based on our effort, would we get the prize? Woe is me. That's why that message hit me so hard at, at divine worship. Woe is me. And what you're going to see is that the Holy Spirit was working, brothers and sisters, because when we left here last night, I told Moses, I said, Jay, this is what God laid on my heart. And I said, I need a slide. I need a slide to help me bring it out because a picture is worth a thousand words. And Moses came down to my room this morning and made this slide that we're going to look at. Brothers and sisters, what we need to understand is that if God was to take us to heaven right now, right now, the way we are, because you know what? A lot of us in our hearts, like Brother Davis said this morning, a lot of us believe we're ready. But if he was to take us right now and he was to take us to heaven and we would walk the streets of gold, and we would enjoy the bliss of heaven. We would see the glory of heaven. And yet have to come back to earth. Sin would still have a hold on us where we could never go back unless we surrender to Christ. Let me prove that from the Bible. Go with me to Matthew chapter 17. Go with me to Matthew chapter 17. Brothers and sisters, we see that in verse 17, or chapter 17, verse 1, and it says, And after six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Now let me ask you a question. Did the glory of heaven rest on Christ at that point? Did the disciples, according to the desire of ages, wake up and see the glory that God bestowed upon his son? Is there any greater glory than Christ? So would the streets make any more difference to you than to see the glory of Christ? And we have the example of Peter that will go down and deny his Lord. See, brothers and sisters, if Christ took you to heaven right now, we would come right back. And the grip that sin has on us. See, we don't believe that sin has this such of a stranglehold on us. We don't believe that we desire sin. Desire of ages. Page 323, listen to what it says. Desire of ages, page 323. The prophet says, unless we become vitally connected with God, we can never resist the unhallowed effects of self-love self-indulgence, and the temptation to sin. We might try. We might put every ounce of effort we have into it, but unless we have a vital connection, it goes on to say, we may leave off many bad habits for a time. We may part company with Satan, but without a vital connection with God, through the surrender of ourselves to him, moment by moment, we shall be overcome without a personal acquaintance with Christ and a continual communion. We are at the mercy of the enemy and shall do his bidding in the end. Now, brothers and sisters, let's, let's study the word of God. Turn with me to the book of James. Let's look at something. Because we need to see we love sin. Turn with me to the book of James, chapter 1. 
James chapter 1. James chapter 1, let's begin with verse 13. The Bible says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Brothers and sisters, how many does it take to have conception? Two people, a man and a woman, right? How many does it take to produce sin in this text? To, no, 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 brothers and sisters, look at the text again. Look at the text again. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own, what? Lust. He, of his own lust. But now he's enticed. Now he's enticed, it says, then when lust has conceived conception too. Here you are. Brother and sister, turn with me to, uh, to Mark chapter 7, verse 21. Let's look at the heart for a second. We're coming back to, to, to James. Let's look at the heart for a second. We need to get the picture. Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, verse 21. The Bible says, For from within... Out of the heart of man proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murder, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and do what? Defile, Defile the man. Now let's go back to James. Go back with me to James chapter 1. And let's re-look at verse 14. Would we say our heart is sick? According to Mark chapter 7, verse 21, do we have some problems in the heart? Okay, now let's relook at verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. Now, brothers and sisters, does sin proceed from the heart according to Mark chapter 7, verse 21? Yes. Out of the heart of man proceeds. Now, let me ask you a question. If you desire the sin, and your heart is sinful and sick, what do you think the devil's going to do to entice you? Do you think he's been watching you all these years? Do you think he's been watching your parents and your grandparents? So all of a sudden, the devil sees what you like. He sees what you watch. He sees what you listen to. He sees everything about you. But it says now all of a sudden, he wants to pull from the heart that sickness. And so what he does is he entices you. He comes to you and he has all different sins, a whole array of them. And he simply says to you, pick one. Come on, pick one. And when you conceive with the devil, it bringeth forth what? According to the Bible. It bringeth forth what? And sin bringeth forth? Brothers and sisters, we don't believe that. There's a thief in this room. Would the thief stand up? See, we don't believe that text. We don't believe Mark chapter 7, verse 21. There's a murderer in this room. Will you stand up? Amen. There's an adulterer in this room. Please stand up. See, are we believing the text? Now all of a sudden, we recognize that our heart is sick. But you know what? I want to show you something that the Lord's showing me. There is a fictitious character that lives in every one of our house. In every one of our marriages that lives in the church. And that fictitious character is named <laughs> Brother and Sister, not me. Not me. Have you ever met him in your house? Come on, have you ever met, met not me? 
Now, when you look in the spirit of prophecy, 197 times she talks about hereditary and cultivated tendencies. Every single time that we say, not me, we cultivate the tendency. And I'm going to show you this thing grows. And when we don't deal with it as children, it grows and it grows. Now, how many, how many times does something happen in your home and all of a sudden you go, who did that? Everybody looks around and said, not me. Come on, not me. But see, when you don't correct not me as a child, then what happens? Come on, now we're going to watch this thing grow. You don't correct it as a child, all of a sudden not me becomes a young adult. Now when you don't correct not me as a young adult, it grows up to an adult. And now it gets deeper. Because not me as an adult is a whole lot harder to train than not me as a child. Now when you don't deal with it as an adult, all of a sudden you come across a beautiful young man or a beautiful young lady and now not me's married. We got any not me's in our marriages? Man. Seriously, have mercy. I mean, look at this. If not me is in your marriage, is anybody saying I'm sorry? Is anybody confessing and repenting? Does it cause a division? Does it cause an all-out war? Let's be honest, brothers and sisters. An all-out war. But it gets deeper. All of a sudden now, not me grows up, and it's a church member. You see the problem? We do not understand the hold that sin has on us. We do not understand how sick our heart is. Because let me tell you this, when you don't deal with not me as a child and it grows into a young adult and then an adult and then it gets married and it's the now, now the church member, Christ comes and all of a sudden Christ says, hey, depart from you, I don't know you. And what does that person say? Not me. Man, I cast out devils for you. I did all this. Not me. And Christ says what? Depart from me. I don't even know you. Brothers and sisters, what we need to do today is deal with not me. You see, the only way that we're going to get victory over sin is to start saying, it's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Turn with me to, uh, to John chapter 15. And we're coming back to James because I have to deal with one more thing in that. But I want to show you something. Go with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Well, you know what? Hold your thumb there. Turn across the page and let's go with, let's go with John chapter 16 and verse 7. You know what? This text in John chapter 16 verse 7 always puzzled me. I never understood what it was that Christ was saying to his disciples. John chapter 16, verse 7. Are we there? John chapter 16, verse 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. I always thought, now wait a minute. Why did Jesus have to leave? Go with me. Turn, turn the page, and let's go back to the 14th chapter, verse 26. John chapter 14, verse 26. Verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and do what? 
And it says, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Who's speaking? Jesus. He said, the, Holy, the, the Comforter, who is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. Now let's look at one more text. Chapter 15, John chapter 15, verse 26. Now keep all these in your mind because we've got we to tie them all together. Verse 26 says, but when the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the what? Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall do what? He shall testify of me. Now, you know what? I, I, I was just asking the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't understand this. Why is it that Jesus couldn't ask for the Holy Spirit to fall on his disciples while he was here? And the Lord, you know what? The Lord is, makes it so simple. We're the ones that make it so difficult. If all of a sudden that the Holy Spirit is going to do, and it's going to testify of Jesus, it's going to reprove the world of sin, all of a sudden, if you, it, let's just say that you're one of the, let's just say that, that, that this lady right here is one of the disciples. And all of a sudden, you're in the upper room. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God comes on you. And now all of a sudden, it starts bringing back to your remembrance Christ. And all of a sudden, you realize the difference between Christ and you. And you see yourself in the nakedness. You see yourself. And you recognize your need of the Savior. Now all of a sudden, you get out on your knees and you confess your sins because he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Who was going to be your high priest in heaven if Jesus was still on the earth? Someone had to plead the blood before the Father. And so when the disciples went into the upper room, when they were in the upper room, what did the Holy Spirit do for them? All of a sudden, remember what they did when they went into the, uh, into the upper room for the Passover, were their hearts right or wrong? They were striving to see who could be first. Nobody was going to wash anybody's feet. They waited now, they were offended. They were a little like, oh, man, we're embarrassed that the Lord had to get up and do it. But did they stop him? You see, brothers and sisters, the difference between the upper room at the Passover and the upper room at Pentecost, no one was striving to be first. All of a sudden, they believed that their hearts were sick. They had seen the way they had acted all through Christ's ministry. The selfishness. Mrs. White tells us that they would pull back, Jesus would be walking. They would pull back simply to argue who was going to be first. They didn't understand the mission. They didn't understand anything about the mission of Christ. You know what's amazing to me? There was only one that understood completely that Jesus came here to die for our sins. And it was one that was looked upon as a hooker, a whore, Mary Magdalene. When she came in, she came in to anoint him for his burial. The disciples didn't have a clue. And when they go into the upper room, now all of a sudden they check self at the door and they sit down and now they begin to open up the scriptures, roll out the scrolls and the Holy Spirit starts bringing back to their mind the life of Christ. Now listen to this, I tell you what, I found this statement in Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace page 264, no excuse me, Amazing Grace page 195, Amazing Grace Page 295, it says the influence of the Holy Spirit is the life of Christ in the soul. Did you get that? The influence of the Holy Spirit is the life of Christ in the soul. So all of a sudden the Holy Spirit started illuminating their minds as to how much Christ loved them. Every 
everything Christ did was love. Every single thing he did on this earth was love. But yet those that he healed, those that he raised, those that he gave recovering of sight to the blind and, and gave unstopped their ears to the deaf, those were the ones that screamed, crucify him. And now the Holy Spirit illuminates their mind to see that, that Jesus is love. Now let me ask a question. Somebody raised their hand that just has the most unbelievable, happy marriage in this room. Get your hand up. Boy, you better get them up. You get in so much trouble. Brother, <laughs> Brother Davis, how much money could I pay you to have an affair on your wife? Oh, come on now. I give you a billion dollars. Two billion. Five billion. How, n why? Why? You what? Okay, now, brothers and sisters, why is it that Brother Davis, did you hear him? Why won't he cheat on his wife? He loves her. Now, did it take time for Brother Davis to fall in love with his wife? Yes or no? It took time. Absolutely. He didn't just all of a sudden, he wasn't just willing to lay down his life. Now, he might not have took that $5 million the day after he met her, but it took time for that relationship to grow. And that's what the Holy Spirit was trying to show the disciples, that the love of Jesus. Now, she says, and steps to Christ. Steps to Christ. Page. Steps to Christ, page 44. Now, here's where too many of us are in our relationship. And we know others that are in the same experience, but yet nobody's admitting it. There are those, page 44, Steps to Christ, page 44. There are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to obey his law to do what? Form a right character. Let's, let's, let, we need to get that again. There are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to obey his law to form a right character and secure salvation. Their hearts are not moved by any deep sense of the love of Christ, but they seek to perform the duties of the Christian life as that which God requires of them in order to gain heaven. How many people, being honest, how many people have had that experience in my hand is the first one up? Question. Read it again. No, this is from Steps to Christ, page 44. It says, there are those who profess to serve God while they rely upon their own efforts to obey his law, to form a right character, and to secure salvation. So here they're relying upon their own efforts to obey his law in order to make, to, to make it to heaven. Their hearts are not moved by any, by any deep sense of the love of Christ, but they seek to perform the duties of the Christian life as that which God requires of them in order to gain heaven. Now again, how many people have had that experience and it's failed? Remember when, remember when uh, the children of Israel were brought out of Egypt and they come to Mount Sinai and God is about to give them the law. Moses goes up in the mountain. God said, go tell the people that I want to meet with them and this is what I want to do. He goes and meets with the elders. And what did the elders say? Everything that God has asked us to do what? We do it. How long did that last? How long did that last? Everything you ask us to do, we do it. It didn't last because they thought they could do it. And how often do we think we can do something? Brothers and sisters, now I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not here to throw any stones at all, but I want to tell you one of our greatest mistakes in evangelism is we do not present, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world with prophecy. Now let me ask you a question. What is prophecy for? Okay, show us where we're going, but, but something else. What is prophecy? What, what would Christ want to give us prophecy for? He's trying to get us to trust him. 
See, we'll say, Lord, I see that you put the sun, the moon, the stars, all the planet in perfect order, but I'm not trusting my life with you. And so what he does is he gives us prophecy, brothers and sisters, so that as these things come to pass, man, we start saying, wow, I can trust him. He said this was going to happen, now I do trust him. And all of a sudden we start saying, wow, I can trust him. Now, Brother Davis, did you instantly have a complete trust for your wife, or did that grow also? Brothers and sisters, Christ can tell us all day long what he's going to do for us, but he knows the sickness of the heart, so he says, you know what, let me give them prophecy so that they can see that I am a God that does what I say. And so as we begin to trust our lives with him and we be hold him, brothers and sisters, we fall in love with him. See, the relationship we're supposed to have in our homes is the plan of redemption. But the devil has perverted it because of this. Not me. It's my wife's fault. It's my husband's fault. It's everybody's fault but mine. God can never deal with that. But as we start saying, it's me. And let me tell you why it's me. Because I have a sick heart. And as we start seeing how sick our heart is versus the righteousness of Christ, the Holy Spirit the influence of the Holy Spirit is the life of Christ in the soul. Christ comes in and abides. And as we behold him day by day in searching his word, we fall in love, brothers and sisters. And we get to the point where we would do go to death before we would break that trust. Can righteousness by faith get any simpler, brothers and sisters? We make it so hard. And let me tell you what the worst thing the devil does to us as a people. We don't present the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world when we present prophecy. And, and you know, come, how many people in here have been to a Daniel Revelation seminar? Come on, raise your hand. Everybody's been in. Come on, we've all been to them, right? What do we do? Daniel 2, Daniel 7, State of the Dead. We boom, 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 and we're on a schedule. Why? Because we have to present the Sabbath within five days before those that we have invited from the Sunday church go back to their church and their pastor tells them to stay away. Come on, you know that's true. We don't have time to present the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world before we present the law. And now all of a sudden people feel guilty. They're torn in their heart. They don't know what to do. And they're going, man, I know that's true. It was so plain, but there's no power to keep it. There's no power. But brothers and sisters, when you present the two in harmony, faith and love, law and grace. You see, you, know, you want me to tell you something? You know why, you know why the Protestant world is going to flood into the Adventist church when they get this message? They already understand grace. They don't understand the law. And when you blend the two perfectly together, brothers and sisters, all of a sudden, you have victory. You have victory over sin. And I'm telling you, there is a deception going through the ranks of the Adventist world. The, the, let me ask you a question. Let me ask it this way. If you come in here and you learn the message of righteousness by faith, do you have the ability to have victory over sin? Yes or no? Yes. Could God, if you have victory over sin, would you be of the 144,000? Yes. Now, the deception is, in the mind of the Adventist world, is to say, hey, if I don't make it in the 144,000, I'll come in under the great multitude. 
You heard that? But let me tell you something. That's a deception. Because I'm telling you what, if Jesus gave you the tools to be among the 144,000, you better be among the 144,000 or you are lost. We're in trouble. I look and say, Lord, do I vindicate your character? Do I reflect the character of Jesus perfectly? Do you? You see why we're in trouble? See, we pray, oh, man, I can't wait for Jesus to come. We better start praying for him to hold the winds. Because we are undone. We are undone. Brothers and sisters, let me show you that there's only two choices. Moses, I don't know how to do this. There's only two choices. Pride or surrender. Now, what is pride, brothers and sisters? Pride is people resisting inspired direction emphatically. Brothers and sisters, I don't care what you show them. I do not care what you show somebody if pride is in the heart, brothers and sisters. If an angel himself came out of heaven to preach the message, you ain't changing. What is surrender? Self unreservedly. Now, brothers and sisters, that's a big word. Think of that word, unreservedly. Restricted, restrained, expecting a new direction, eventually bringing redemption. There's the plan, brothers and sisters. We must believe with all of our heart that our heart is exactly the way the Bible says it is. That's why Mrs. White says, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Why does she say that? She says, we need to understand that statement because it, it is, here's what it's saying. Lord, I believe that Jesus came and died on the cross. I believe there's salvation. But Lord, help my unbelief to believe that my heart is really the way you tell me it is. We need to surrender our preconceived idea right now. Brothers and sisters, I don't want to be lost. And let me tell you something. And I'm not saying this is for a joke. There was a fisherman named Sam. And every day he would go fishing. And he would go out on the water and he would come back in and he just had fish, stringers of them. And all the other fishermen are coming back with maybe one, maybe two fish. And people are looking going, man, how does he do it? And so they went to the warden and they said, hey, you need to go check out Sam. Something's wrong. And so the warden comes to Sam and he says, Sam... I'm going to ride with you tomorrow when you go fishing. He said, all right, it's no problem. He went down to the boat, 8 o'clock in the morning, and the warden gets in the boat. And they go out, way out into the lake. Sam turns the boat off, reaches in his tackle box and grabs a stick of dynamite, stuffs a cap and fuse in it, lights it up and throws it in the water. All of a sudden, boom, fish start floating to the top. 
Man, and Sam is getting a net, and he is netting them, and he is throwing them in the boat just as fast as he can. Tons of fish. And the warden's sitting there going, what are you doing? Sam, you can't do that. Sam, you can't fish like that. Sam sets the net down, walks back over to his tackle box, grabs another stick of dynamite, puts a cap and fuse in it, lights it, and throws it in the warden's lap. It says, you just going to sit there or are you going to fish? <laughs> Think about that, brothers and sisters. I'm not, you know what, I ain't even trying to be funny. But what I'm telling you is, we have the bomb. We have a message that you either going to fish with or die with. Fish with or die with. And I'm telling you, we better start fishing. And we better go unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Because, brother, th brothers and sisters, think about it. If we went to the world right now and we went and preached them a message, where are you going to take them? Where are you going to take them? We have to give them victory. We have to show them victory. We have to give them somewhere to go. And you know what? Sometimes it's hard to have to tell these truths. I'll tell you what I remember a few years ago. My mother was in the hospital and she had been really sick. And I didn't know how sick. I went off flying one day. And when I came back, I landed at the airport. We got out of the plane and I'm walking back over with a friend of the car. And my aunt ran up to me and she says that they just had to take your mother to the hospital. They're doing emergency surgery on her. We got back in the plane, and I flew over to the town where I live now called Bozeman, Montana. And I went in to the hospital, and I wanted to see my mother before she went into surgery because I had a really uneasy feeling. And I said, you know what, I want to see, see my mom. And they said, you can't. She's already prepped for surgery. She's already going in. We don't have time to let you see her. And I said, man, please, please. They did surgery on my mom. She came out about four hours later. And they were wheeling her to the, to the room that she was in, that she was going to be in. And there was all these hoses and cords and all this stuff all over her. And I'm like, man, my sisters had shown up. We all went into the room. And as they were getting my mom ready to stay in that room, all of a sudden my mom coded. And now all of a sudden there's a panic. And they're running around the room. They tip the, 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 the bed back where her head's went, laying clear down, and they do what's called a cut down on her. Blood is all over. That didn't work. So they got the paddles, and they start sh And we're all standing there in the room, just shocked. I'm just amazed. My, my sisters are screaming. And I'm like, Lord, please let her live. Please. They got her going again. But from that point on, my mom was on life support. About five days later, the doctor told us, he said, you know what, we're going to we're gonna have to do another surgery. He said, what has happened is she had an ulceration in her stomach. And this ulceration, when she was lifting her father that was dying into bed, had ruptured. And when it ruptured, it leaked into the cavity, and she got peritonitis throughout her body, and it was eating all of her organs. It was eating everything. They didn't even, have, the doctor said when he would try to sew things back together, it would just pull through. It was just like rotting inside. And so the doctor told us, he said, you know what, we got, we got we to gotta do surgery again. And he said, you know what, it doesn't look good. We called for the elders of the church. We went and we prayed with my mom. And we said, you know, she couldn't talk. She was on life support. All she could do was just shake her head. We prayed for her and everything, and she went into surgery. And she made it. Like, praise God, she made it. But the doctor told us, he said, I did what I could when I was in there. He said, she's going to die. She's got probably five or six days to live. We went to the family room. We're sitting in the family room. 
And my sister said, don't anybody break her spirits. Don't anybody say a word to her. Just let her go in peace. And there was a struggle in her. There was a struggle in her. And when everybody left, I went into her room. Now, the easiest thing for me to do would have been to fluff her pillow and comb her hair and just let her die in peace. But the Holy Spirit told me to tell her that she was going to die. She couldn't talk, so she saw that I was crying and that I was greatly troubled. And she had a little notepad, and she wrote, she wrote, what's wrong? And I said, Mom, you're not the only one. I said, the doctor's given you about six days to live. My mom went into the hospital at 102 pounds and died at 200, uh, 205 pounds 23 days later blew up like a balloon from, from the oxygen and all the stuff that they were putting in her to make her live. And I stood there at her bedside and I said, Mom, I would love to tell you you're going to live. I would love to tell you that everything's fine, don't worry about it. But Mom, the truth of the matter is, you've got six days to live. I said, Mom, I want to be with you on that resurrection day. I wasn't even walking with Christ. But I said, Mom, I'll tell you what. I'm going to meet you at that gravesite. The tears started streaming down her face. She died, she died five days later. Why do I tell you that? Because, brothers and sisters, it would be much easier to go back to your churches and fluff their pillows and comb their hair <laughs> Brothers and sisters, you better take back the right message. That unless you have victory over sin, you're going to die. You're going to die. Do we understand what God has given us as a church? The only message that can give us salvation is righteousness by faith. By beholding Christ, we fall in love with him and will not break that relationship for love nor money. You know, brothers and sisters, when Brother Davis made an appeal this morning, the Lord brought a thought to my mind. How many people, when they know that they're lost, know that they're in trouble, would love to hear that appeal one more time. Brothers and sisters, do we recognize by the word of God tonight that our heart is sick and that we truly need a Savior, that we desire sin? See, you can't leave here unless you understand that we desire sin. If the, if, you know what, if the, if the Lord did away with the devil and you never sinned again, you still need the righteousness of Christ. It isn't the devil, brother and sister, the devil made me do it. No, you desired it. He simply offered it to you. Do we understand that tonight? The card said today, do we understand righteousness by faith?
that the only way we're going to get the victory is to fall in love with Jesus as the Holy Spirit brings to remembrance his life. And as we behold his life, that's why she says we must think a thoughtful hour a day, spend a thoughtful hour a day contemplating the life of Christ. Especially the closing scenes. Brothers and sisters, you will never get the crown without the cross. Ever. See, we want, to, we want the crown, but nobody wants to go to the cross. And let me tell you something. Our salvation was not won at the cross of Calvary. Follow me, brother and sister. Our salvation was not won at the cross of Calvary. It was won in the Garden of Gethsemane. He sealed his decision in Gethsemane. That's why he could lay his arms out on the cross and simply say, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Because his decision was sealed in, in the garden. And I'm telling you what, if you aren't making a decision right now, in the garden time that God has given us, you're going to be lost. Because you'll never go to the cross. Had Jesus not said, not my will, but thy will be done, he would have never gone through with it, brothers and sisters. What are you doing in your garden of sin? Can God trust you as one of the team? On the field? Brothers and sisters, I want to appeal to you again. If you see tonight, if you see clearly tonight that you need a new heart. Not that you just want to be saved. We all want to be saved. But that you need a new heart, that your heart is desperately wicked. It's deceitful. It's deceived me this long into believing that I was all right when I was all wrong. You need a new heart tonight. Brothers and sisters, do not stand unless you understand this message. Because when you stand now, when you stand now, you pronounce judgment on yourself because Christ tells you, you've learned everything you need to know about how to gain the victory. There's nothing more he can show you. If you need a new heart tonight, if you recognize that your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, stand with me. Because I need a new heart in Christ Jesus. And brothers and sisters, I challenge every one of you as you leave here and as you go back to your churches, that you behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world that took away your sins and my sins. And as you behold him, brothers and sisters, and you start that relationship of love with him for love nor money, you won't break it. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to the kingdom. I am not going through all of this and being lost. And I want to make a commitment with you right now, and I want you to make a commitment that we are going to meet around the tree of life, and we're going to hold hands around that tree, and we're going to sing the song, brothers and sisters, the song of Moses and the Lamb. Oh, mercy. Brother Moses, please. I tell you what, I praise God for someone faithful that would stand as a true shepherd to feed the flock. Moses, please.
trust us. God has been so good to us. God is so gracious to us, brothers and sisters. Let us kneel. And let us just again consecrate ourselves again. Praise God for what he's done for us this year. Lord have mercy. Father in heaven, in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ, Lord, you're an awesome God. Lord, you manifested yourself here. You manifested yourself here in a mighty way. You have showed us, Lord, that you're who you say you are, that you are the creator of the heavens and the earth, and that you love us so much, Lord, you want to save us. And you've taken, Lord, mere men. And you've taken control of their brains and their lips. And you had them to speak your words, Lord, with power. And then these words, Lord, have touched our hearts, Lord. And has helped us to see ourselves as we are. Just as David saw himself, Lord, after he killed Uriah. He saw himself. And he said, Lord, create in me a, cl a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. And Lord, that's our petition as we come this evening. Create in us, dear Lord, a clean heart. Renew in us a right spirit. Let us not leave out of this place, Lord, the way that we came. Let us not go back down into the valley, Lord, the way we came up. And Lord, please, as we go back, we must go back now with a message. Lord, we must go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we must tell them, Lord, that they don't get sin in their life by the power of the indwelling Christ, Lord. They'll be lost. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that's done for us and all that you will do for us. And even now, Lord, as we come to the end of this prayer, if there's another, if there's a soul here that did not make that commitment this morning to give their life to the Lord. We want to give you that opportunity right now. Is that one? We're looking over the audience. Is that one? That did not make that commitment. Is that one? Father, we will close this prayer. Again, we thank you for all that has done for us and all that you are doing. In Jesus' name. and sisters, I think we've had enough today. <laughs> yes, sir. I want to remind you as we prepare to dismiss, if you want something to take in the valley, to give to your brothers and sisters, I want to remind you about the book, The Closing Probation for Seven-Day Adventists. Right here at the back. We got them in packs of 25 for $31. And we're not trying to make money on these books. We're trying to get them out to God's people. So if you pass by the table, you can get these books to give to your fellow brethren and sisters that don't know, do not know that they got to have sin out of their life by the passing of the national assembly law. Brother Davis, you need to say anything. All right. As they say in the Baptist church, if all hearts and minds are clear, we can consider ourselves dismissed. <laughs>